That's why I'm easy. I'm easy like Sunday morning. It's why I'm easy. Yeah, I'm easy like Sunday Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to welcome you all to the Dankwa Institute Breast Cancer Awareness Symposium. Before we start, I want us to say a word of prayer. Please, shall we rise for that? Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for life. We thank you for health. We thank you for strength. We thank you for an opportunity to gather this evening for an impactful program. It's our prayer that the efforts and the resources that has been invested to put this program will not go in vain, but go a long way to touch a lot of lives. Father, your word says that the expectations of the righteous shall not be cut short. Therefore, let the outcome of this um, program exceed our expectations. Thank you for a favorable weather. We pray and ask for your presence to dwell with us. And at the end of it all, we shall be careful to give you all the glory. This we ask in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Let everyone say amen. amen. Okay. At this point, we shall welcome our executive director, Dr. Antoinette Chivudakun. Thank you. My awesome panelists and super amazing ladies and gentlemen and the ever-present media, all our distinguished people who are joining us today via Facebook, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here this late afternoon. Thank you very much. 
irrespective of the roadblocks and the weather, you have taken time off to grace us with your presence physically and for those who have joined us virtually as well. The Dankwa Institute has over the years played an active role in providing the platform for dialogue and discussions with various stakeholders. Upon my ascension as the executive director of this great institute, together with my incoming fellows, we initiated several programs, one of which is the DI Advocacy Tract Room. About two weeks ago, Dr. Isamoro, a fellow of the institute who is also an optometrist, gave a lecture on glaucoma to commemorate World Sight Day. For us, these initiatives aim at providing discussions that are apolitical, and we intend to ensure that we deal with these issues that concern our citizens to help build our nation Ghana, irrespective of gender, ethnic background, religious affiliation, and our political beliefs. Breast cancer is the most frequently diagnosed cancer amongst women worldwide, the most prevalent being in low and middle income countries, which are also experiencing a double burden of other non-communicable diseases. In Ghana, for the year 2020 alone, there were 4,482 breast cancer cases, accounting for 18.7% of all cancer cases. There were also 2,055 deaths as a result of breast cancer, which accounted for 13% of all cancer-related deaths. In fact, most women tend to be unaware of the condition until there is a palpable mess, mass or some visible deformity in the breast before they then tend to seek for attention. Current research also shows that people delay in seeking medical care for breast cancer due to previous medical complications which they do not understand, ignorance, or that there's a painless nature of the lump and therefore it gives them the impression that it is just like any other lump and it will soon disappear. This delay could also be attributed to the stigma associated with breast cancer because of surgical imp impressions and etc. Or the difficulties even in accessing medical care and with cancer care and even more so the high cost of treatment, especially when the di disease has progressed beyond an early stage. We are therefore as an institute supporting the Breast Cancer Awareness Month with this symposium. We are happy to have eminent speakers for today's program. There is a need to intensify the conversation for all, not only to get involved in the discussion, but to actually deliberate upon it, to pay greater attention to it, to give more credence to awareness, to care, and to management of breast cancer. Dankwa Institute is the MPP party's policy think tank. But we take a neutral stand here, and we support all and sundry, and hope that this symposium and this program will cause a stir up in the policy conversation on the establishment of a national breast cancer registry and the formulation of a control and treatment policy throughout Ghana. Breast cancer cases will continue to increase in the coming years, and policy is what will enable us to dedicate more resources as a nation for there to be more services, to fund more interventions, and to give us value for money. You are all warmly welcome. Pay attention and enjoy the discussion. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. I'd like to add my voice to the welcome and say you are warmly welcome. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Ernestina Denchi, and I'm going to be your moderator for the rest of the session. We flash them. We smash them. We push them way up in the wrong size, in the wrong size cup. Our boyfriends slash husbands just crave them. Our children have drained them. Some of us have even decided to name them Twin Towers, mm -hmm. Apple and Eve, mm -hmm. Adam and Eve, mm -hmm. you name them. We go through our lives and knock mm -hmm. them about. But one thing is certain. One thing I must shout. 
Our boobs have been there through thick and thin, and life is too precious to let cancer win. Mm -hmm. On this note, I'd like to welcome Nura the poet to continue. Take the tempo higher. Nura. Mm -hmm. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Good evening. Um, so I'll be doing two poems today. And the first one is titled Strength. And here's how it goes. Hey, tell me what strength is. If you could tell me what strength really was, I would break through the earth crust with my bare hands and fetch you some magma. Hard enough to melt flesh in seconds, cool enough for me to withstand, and I would hand it right over. As the lexicon suggests, strength is the quality or state of being physically strong. And I ask, what about the mental? What about the emotional? As flawed as our perception of strength and power may be, we need to understand that you are only truly strong by the amount of pressure and force you can withstand. The trials and tribulations we overcome that make us stronger, the beats and the cracks, the fall down flats, the downs and the ups, and essentially our survival and perseverance through it all, that is strength. If you think strength and true power is gender specific about muscles, genetics, or body mass, then your perception of strength is a stroke symptom, paralyzed, weak, imbalanced, and leaning only to one side. One may ask a woman, where does your strength lie? I say, it is in the straps of our holder, the lumps that we smolder. It is in the fondle of our breasts. It is in our ability to overcome, to overcome the things with which we are naturally endowed. So be it my last resort. I will rise again like La Zeros, even if I am cancerous. I shall conquer and give it my all, because that is who I am uncharacterized, curtailed, or defined by the rampant jabs of the unfair world, weathering all storms and standing tall in the face of many adversities. I'm bowed, I'm bent, I'm broken, hopeful, courageous, formidable, and strong. That's the end of my first piece. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. And the second one, I think the man here could pay an extra ear to me, attention. It's titled To All the Boys I'd Ever Love. <laughs> to all the boys I'd ever love. My deepest fear is not that I'm inadequate. It is that I'd be a striking force strong enough to crush the inflated ego society helped you create. That my confidence keeps shooting to the roof and there ain't nothing that works the earth that can stop me from reaching the stars, heck, about to the galaxies, the Milky Way, and anything beyond there could possibly be. To all the boys I'd ever love. See, since my mother gave me birth, I was a threat to a chauvinist world. A world that couldn't bear to see me win and thrive and succeed. A world not too thrilled about my existence, so down to the ground I'm hurled. A world that shuts opportunities in my face because I'm too girly and feminine to compete. Swirled and twirled in a world that has claimed the man's. You're too loud, that's too skimpy, don't we deserve a break for once? I remember I was told to look down and keep my shoulders slumped because that was supposed to be humility. As if it wasn't torture enough, I was told to speak less in male-dominated spaces because it signified modesty. 
but I was born to use my voice and not be tossed around. Ah, you will hear this sound. I won't be bound. I won't be drowned. Ladies, let down the gowns. Pick up your crowns. Wipe off your frowns. And let us remind this world of what we have become. That we are fierce and greatness and strength embodied. That they came through our manholes and shouldn't be so cocky. That we make their houses homes. We laugh, we cry, we laugh and condone. That all our emotions make us human, not weak. That our monthly periods are not subjects of mockery, disgust or discreet. That our love for makeup and beauty doesn't make us catfish or hungry for attention. That we are not tools for a man's amusement. We didn't come to give them company. We were purposefully created, unique designed and brought to be our own somebody. Isn't it funny how we call nature mother when we don't respect her at all? That he but not she is the ideal pronoun to be used for God? I'm not a hater but could you blame me for my anger and rage when in life at every stage I go through unwarranted pain? If you feel threatened by my triumphs then I suggest you move to Mars. Because I have only just begun to fade these invisible scars. So, to all the boys I'd ever love. I do hope you've listened to all that I've said. This is for you to be prepared for this broken girl you'd ever love. Thank you. Thank you, Nura. Let's do it better for Nura. <laughs> Nura, the boys have heard you. They are here, they are here. And to all the boys who are here to support us, we say thank you. Thank you so much for being here. So at this time, just like the name of the symposium, it's a chat room. So there will be no more standing. I'm going to sit by my panelists, and the chat will begin. So please clap for me. <laughs> At this point, I want to, please, you hear me? Do you hear me? Am I good? Yeah. At this point, I'd like to introduce my distinguished panel. Some of you, where's my phone? You all have the program, and you have their beautiful photos and their beautiful profiles, but I'll run through them very quickly. So on my immediate right is Dr. Florence Dede. She's a senior lecturer with the de Department of Surgery at the University of Ghana Medical School and a surgeon at the Kolugu Teaching Hospital. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Medical Sciences and a Bachelor's Degree in Medicine and Surgery from the University of Ghana Medical School. She's also a researcher and she focuses on breast diseases, specifically cancer, and how to improve outcomes. She's currently engaged in a few research projects that center around her area of interest. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Florence Dede. Next to Dr. Dede is Dr. Nelson Aguado, trained at the University of Ghana Medical School and has been practicing for 11 years. He's a member of the Ghana College of Surgeons and Physicians. Currently, he's doing his fellowship in general surgery at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital. He's a Christian and he's married with three children. He's also passionate about reducing breast cancer mortality through early detection and appropriate treatment. Dr. Aguado. Next to him, Mrs. Suzanne Malik. She's the founder of the Modloco Breast Cancer Foundation. She's a travel consultant and owner of Malik Foods. She's a, she survived a stage three breast cancer two years and a couple of months ago. She has been married for 16 years and has three children. Mrs. Malik. <laughs> so on my far right, not the last, last but not the least, Dr. Bernard Okoboy, Honorable, is a licensed medical practitioner by profession and holds a Bachelor of Science in Human Biology, a Bachelor's Degree in Medicine and Surgery from the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. He also holds a Master's Degree in Public Health from Hamburg, Hamburg School of Applied Sciences. On December 7, 2016, he was elected as a member of parliament for Lejukuku constituency on the ticket of the New Patriotic Party. 
He also served as a member of the Health and Governance, Government Assurances Committees of the Seventh Parliament. On April 4th, 2020, Dr. Kuboy was nominated by President Akufuado to serve as a Deputy Health Minister, a position he held till the end of 2020. He is currently a member of the board of the National Health Insurance Authority. Dr. Kuboy. So my distinguished panel, here are your distinguished audience. They are all here to listen and learn. So we are going to kick in right, start right with our discussion. So this is how it's going to go. I'm going to direct questions. Some may be specific. Others, if you have, um, somebody has answered and you also have an opinion to share, you can always come in. It's supposed to be a chat. Yeah. So let's make it seamless and smooth. All right, so I'm going to start, and I'd like to start with Dr. Nabuado to give us a general idea of what is breast cancer when we see. I know there are a lot of myths around it. So what is it? What is it not? Will you also tell us who is at risk? And then what are the common symptoms that people should look out for? Thank you very much. So when we talk about breast cancer, we are talking about <clears throat> a cancer that is specific to the breast. Um, when we talk of cancer in general, when they talk of cancer in general, um, usually there are cells that do not obey that do not obey the normal control system of the body. The normal control system of the body is that a cell is supposed to function. When it functions, some of them die, they are replaced by new ones. But cancer cells continue to grow and grow and grow. And when they grow, then the tendency that they will, some of it will break and go to other parts of the body is there. So such a thing can happen in the breast, and when it happens in the breast, we call it breast cancer. Now, there are a lot of myths about breast cancer. People have a lot of uh, things that they know about breast cancer, which is not true. Um, some of the things are that some people say when you have a cancer, that cancer is not a hospital disease. So you shouldn't go to hospital for it to be treated. So they go elsewhere for treatment. Other people believe that if you are somebody who take uh, your lifestyle very well, you eat well, you don't take alcohol, you don't smoke, you don't do anything, then there is no way that you ever get breast cancer. And also some people also believe that if your family, there is nobody in your family who has breast cancer, you also not get breast cancer. And some people believe also that every lump in the breast is a cancer. And other people believe that um, when you put phones or you use deodorant, then you are at risk of getting breast cancer. So all these things are things that people believe, which are not necessarily true, because there's no evidence to show. And uh, talking about the symptoms of breast cancer, things that when you have will let you think that you have a breast cancer, the first one is that when you have a lump, most of the time the cancers are a lump in the breast. So having a lump in the breast, there is a tendency that that lump is a breast cancer. As I said, the myth is not that every lump in the breast, people believe that every lump in the breast is a cancer, which is not true. But having a lump uh, in the breast, it can be a cancer. So there is the need to seek medical attention. So that is the main thing. And the lump is usually painless. There is no pain. And that is the reason why some people don't go to the hospital. Because once something is not giving you a pain, people will not bother to seek any, any uh, medical... Uh, they will never seek medical attention. So the lump, painless lump in the breast is one. Then having nipple discharge, that is usually bloody. So you are somebody, there has never been any discharge from your nipple, then all of a sudden you realize that there is a discharge from your breast and it is bloody. It can raise the alarm that it can be a cancer. Then also, having nipple retraction. The nipple is usually pointing outwards. But if all of a sudden, a sudden nipple retraction, some people naturally, their nipples, have, they've gone inside. So sometimes you have to stimulate it for, for it to come. That may not be a cancer, like from your child, maybe adolescent, the two of them, they are inside and they have to. But if it was outside, then just suddenly you realize that the nipple has retracted. 
then it can raise an alarm that something is happening. So you have to seek medical advice. Then having sores around your nipple areola, the nipple and the areola, the black area around the nipple, when you realize that there is a sore there, you have an ulcer there, you can point to. Or sometimes it, cannot, it will not be a sore, it will just be some rashes. You can point to the fact that it's, there is possibly a breast cancer. Or your, the skin of your breast starts changing and it becomes like the orange peel, like what you call podorange. Like it becomes like an orange. It can be a sign that there is, you may have a breast cancer. Or sometimes there will not be any lump in your breast at all, but you can mm -hmm. feel that there is something in your armpit, mm -hmm. which we call a lymph node. It can be a sign that there is a breast cancer. So all these things that I've talked about are things that can suggest that a breast, you have a breast cancer. What are the risk factors? The cause we don't know, but we know that there are certain things that a risk that can predispose us to having the cancer. Some of them we can do something about, others we can't do anything about. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the main risk factors is the fact that you have a breast, <laughs> which means that anybody that has a breast is at risk of getting breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Then, talking about breasts, we know that females' breasts are, usually, are supposed to be bigger because of hormonal changes at adolescent age. So, then it means that females at high risk of getting breast cancer as compared to males. So these are very important risk factors. Then risk factors that are associated with the production of the hormone estrogen. The estrogen is a female hormone. It's more, males also have estrogen, but it's more in females. So that hormone plays a very important role as far as breast cancer is concerned. Mm. So things that can allow this hormone to be in your system for a very long time are things that can predispose you. Therefore, somebody who starts menstruating very early, that we call early menarche, below the age of 12 years, any person that starts menstruating, it means that a person has a very long way for estrogen to act in the body. So then the tendency is that the person is at risk. Then if you stop menstruating late, late menopause, maybe around 55, beyond, you are still menstruating, then your risk go high. Then somebody who does not give birth early, so if giving birth you delay, usually from the risk increases from 30 and above. But the, the, the further you are in age before you give birth to your first, first child, then the tendency of getting breast cancer, the risk goes very high. Then, as I said, it's all because of hormones. It's believed that people who give birth, they get pregnant. When you get pregnant, the hormone changes. So estrogen alone is not working. Progesterone coming. At a point, uh, prolactin also comes in. So all these hormones come to interfere the action of, of uh, estrogen. So then it means that it reduces the activity of only estrogen working throughout, which is one of the hormones that the cancer cells uh, uh, use to grow. Then people who do not breastfeed their children, it's also known that the risk is very high in that. Then people who have never given birth at all, if you have not given birth at all, the risk of getting breast cancer is high. And even it's higher in people who have never gotten pregnant, giving birth, and are not married. Their risk is higher than those who are married and have not given birth. So all these things are things that can predispose, uh, are the risk factors for breast cancer. So you realize that all the things that I've talked about, you can't do much about most of them, like the age at which you menstruate, the age at which you can't, do, you can't do much about this one. I mean, also getting pregnant. And people who marry, they don't get pregnant. Now I, you don't have, but there are some that are modifiable that you can do something about. Those are usually our diet. So it's been known that people who take high fatty diet, who consume alcohol, smoking, and also uh, things that predispose. But if you are somebody who take a lot of fruit, you do exercise, it decreases the risk. It doesn't mean that when you do these things, you cannot get it. Then the family history of breast cancer is also very, very important. If you have a family history, somebody in your family has a breast cancer, especially the first degree relative. So your mother, your auntie, your sister, those people, if they have breast cancer, then the risk of you getting the breast, breast cancer is very high. And also there are certain genetic predispositions. There are certain genes that when you have also increases your risk of getting it. That is what you call the BRCA1 and BRCA2. So all these things are things that 
uh, risk factors for getting breast cancer. Thank you, Doc. Thank you so much. This is very insightful. Thank you. And about the myths, I've even heard people say that I'm a good girl. I married a virgin. I can never get breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of myths going out there. So going on out there. So thank you for enlightening us on what it is not and what it is. Dr. Adede, would like to talk some research. Doc, please, could you help us with some statistics um, on breast cancer prevalence in Ghana? And what would you say are the health-seeking behaviors of patients? Are people reporting early, late? Okay, so I think um, the executive director actually mentioned the figures when she spoke. So from the estimates we have, we know that in the year 2000, we had about 4,000 new cases of breast cancer. And looking back to similar estimates that we had in 2012, the figure then was about 2,000. So it shows that it is increasing, and that's the worldwide trend, especially so in developing countries. The number of new cases are increasing. When we take the deaths as well, in 2020, the estimated figure is about 2,000. And again, that has doubled from what was estimated in 2012, which was 1,000. So generally, we see that breast cancer is increasing. Unfortunately, the deaths are also increasing. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the reasons why that is so is, like you mentioned, the health-seeking behavior. Unfortunately, um, there's a lot that goes into the decision whether to come to hospital at all or to have treatment. And one of the things is, is the, the beliefs. There are a lot of myths, misconceptions, as has just been enumerated. Because of that, people tend to be so afraid to come to hospital. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people know that or think that when you get breast cancer, it means you are going to die. And I think that is um, fueled by the fact that most survivors don't talk about the fact that they have survived breast cancer. So unfortunately, all we get to hear about is those who do not make it. But there are a lot of people who have made it, and today we would hear um, from a survivor here. So increasingly, which is a good thing, survivors in Ghana are talking. So it makes people aware of the fact that breast cancer is not a death sentence. You could actually get it and survive. And that encourages people to go to hospital. So in Kolibu, for instance, we have survivors who come during our OPDs, our clinics, and they talk to the patients. There are times when, as health personnel, we talk to them, we mention what we want to do, and they really don't want to come back. But when they hear the survivors talk, they see them, they know that they have been through it, it encourages them and it makes them um, want to move forward. Another area of, um, or another problem is the cost. Cost of breast cancer treatment is high. Luckily, it's one of the, um, the cancers, one of two cancers on the National Health Insurance Scheme, and I'm sure um, Dr. Kuboy can talk more about that. But despite that, there are still costs to it, both direct and indirect. So at the end of the day, at the end of breast cancer treatment, there's a lot of cost financial implication. And that the, the interesting thing is at times that people don't even know what the cost implications are, but they just know it will be expensive. So I wouldn't even come. So that tends to keep um, people away. Another thing is um, some people tend, because of all the negative things about breast cancer, um, they tend to spiritualize the disease. We know that as Ghanaians, we tend to spiritualize a lot of things. And somehow, what you can't explain things, Dr. Abadou mentioned that we don't really know the causes, but we know risk factors. So when there are any things left hanging, then it gives room for spiritual explanations. And unfortunately, when people spiritualize things, then they think that they don't need to seek any medical attention. So they would rather go to a prayer camp, they would rather go to a prayer house or a church house, whatever it is and spend a lot of time there. By the time they finally get to our end, the hospitals, it's a bit too late. One thing with breast cancer is that when it is detected early and treated effectively, that is when it can be cured. When you don't detect it early, the chance of having a cure is reduced significantly. So if after you find a lamp, studies have shown that some people, average time between when they see a lamp or an abnormality and when they report to hospital, it's about eight months, which is worrying, because the longer you stay, the bigger the lump becomes, the more likely it is to spread, and the less likely we are to be able to cure it. So I think that's, that's another issue. I think I'll leave it here.
Yeah, Doc, talking about survivor, what are the survivor rates? We right. only hear the bad news. Sure. This number of deaths, what about the survivor? All right, so like I said, once you pick it early, then the chance of surviving it is very good. So for studies that have been done in Ghana in the past 10 years, um, it's been shown that when you pick it up at the very early stage, so we have between stages zero and stage four, and zero and one are the earliest stages. When you pick it at that stage, after five years, more than 90% of these people are still alive. On the other hand, when you pick it up at stage four, which is the latest possible stage when the disease has spread, Dr. Abuado mentioned that it can leave the breast and go to other places. So when you pick it up in stage four, the same study showed that after five years, only 15% of those people were alive. So it helps us to understand why generally in terms of breast cancer, we don't seem to be doing so well and um, we are losing a number of women to breast cancer because we are picking it up late. When we pick it up early, so when you look at the developed world where about 80, 85% of their cases are picked early, their overall survival rates are higher. We have 80, 85% picked up late, so then our overall survival is low. But when you break it down to the different stages, when it is picked up early, survival is very good. Thank you so much, Doc. So when we pick it up late, survival is low. But we are happy. We have a survivor here. She survived stage three cancer. She's a, she's a powerhouse, and she has decided she will not sit and let other women suffer what she suffered. So she has decided to speak up at every given opportunity. So she's here. Mrs. Malik, thank you so much for being here. We want to hear your story. We've heard statistics. We've heard te terminologies. We want, to, we want to come home. We want to come home. So we want, we want you to talk to us. I mean, the a survivor's journey. When and how did you detect the, the stranger in your body or the problem, that there was a problem with your breast? And walk us through the initial stages. What did you do when you were diagnosed? Were you in denial? Did you cry? Did you run to your pastor? So talk to us. Yeah. As for when it was detected and I was told, I didn't panic. And I remember the doctor asking me, did you hear what I said? Mm -hmm. I'm suspecting breast cancer. I said, yes, I heard you. I said, is that all you could say? I said, yes. It has come. The next thing is to ginger up and fight it. And at, at that time, the only thing that I was, I was battling with in my mind was how my family would take it. At the time, I have not heard about detailed um, um, issues on breast cancer. So I didn't even know how the whole thing is like. But the cancer attached to the breast was my concentration. And um, Doug mentioned few risks that one is exposed to. And I, I fit myself in the family history thing, though it wasn't a breast cancer history. It was a prostate cancer history in my family. So when I was told that I left the hospital, I tried to gather energy. OK, come again. So Doc talked about the time that people detect the mm -hmm. abnormality yeah. and the time they report. So what was yours? When did you detect I, I, it? I, I, I can't tell it? specifically when the I got in it. No, I'm talking about when you saw it and when you reported. What was the space in between? When I noticed there was something, it was less than a month. Then you reported? Yes. OK, good. But then I want to believe that I was carrying it around. Of course. Because it's painless. Right. Yes, that's what I believe. Right. So I cannot say specifically I had it like a year or two or right. even some few months before okay. I went to the hospital. But when you saw it, when you took I a felt month, there was something about wrong a month with me, and then you reported, yes, right. I was at the hospital. Okay. And um, at the time there was pain. When I felt there was something wrong with me, I, I was in pain. But the pain I had, which led me to the hospital, was, of course, the lamb. But prior to that, some months or maybe a year before then, I had a sharp pain in my chest, which I thought I didn't sleep well in my bed. And that's the reason. But later reading, after I was diagnosed, I tried to read more on it. I noticed it can start from 
your chest. You can have it in your armpits and all that. So I want to believe at the time I felt those pains in my chest, I had it. But talk of the, how visible it was that I, it prompted me to be at the hospital. It was in the space of one month. Okay. So when I got there, the touches just revealed that it could be. So it was just a suspicion. And I was giving labs and scans to run for verification. And I always read my reports before I give it to the doctor. Dr. Abuado <laughs> is my witness. I read and psych my mind before I go to him to tell me it's A or B. Because the jargons, you know, if they hit you like that, then confusion. <laughs> I wasn't ready for those kind of confusions. I read through and I saw and the things that were not too pleasant. Mm -hmm. I wasn't bothered anyway. Why and weren't you? Why weren't you? When you were told... You didn't seem, um, seem alarmed. You saw yeah. the thing yourself. You were not bothered. What was it? I, 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 I spoke about prostate being my family. Oh, of course. The fact that it is there doesn't mean you shouldn't be alarmed that it's happening to you. Mm -hmm. So what was your... The thing is, what energized me was I, I was taking or carrying the cross of cancer in my family. Okay. And it should end with me. Right. So if I allow it to def defeat me... That means it will continue to eat up people in the family. Right. So when I, 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 I got it or I was diagnosed of it, I just decided that we are going to fight. Okay. And I must win. Mm. So if I allow worry to enter, then I've lost the battle already before I even begin. Okay. So the mental that Nura talked about. Exactly. You. And that was why I was mm. like that. Because right. if I don't psych... I can't make it. No right. matter the counseling and all, right. I wouldn't make it. Unfortunately, there hasn't been any case of breast cancer in the family that I would say, because of this person I'm looking up, I had no clue. Right. I, exactly. So personal in, inspiration. Right. So I started the treatment. The first visitation, I went alone mm -hmm. when I was told. Right. But subsequently, Mr. Malik, my husband, joined me. Okay. And we'll I'm... talk about treatment. We'll come back. All right. So let me go to... Hold sure. that. Hold that thought right there. Because I have a question on treatment. So I'll come back to you. All right. Thank you so much. So you heard from her. The mental strength. She went in mentally prepared. She had declared war before war came to her to meet, to, to meet cancer boot for boot. And I think that she's here because of that. Honorable. Policy. So Dr. Doc hinted that um, there are... NHIS covers some part of the cancer <clears throat> cost. Yeah. So I would like to know from you, um, give us more details about that. Do you think it's adequate? What are the general funding arrangements and challenges yeah. surrounding breast cancer? Well, first of all, let me thank you for this platform. And um, let me say that breast, breast cancer issues are not only matters for women, but you know the men are stakeholders. Yes. Important stakeholders. <laughs> more, more often than not, either we have investment in the person having the best issue, <laughs> or we are interested in a person. Investment. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, there is a study that was carried out by Frank and Nakugate and his colleagues et al. in 2016. Very interesting study. So they, they randomly picked 3,000 women across five regions, Itaka, Shanti, Volta, Brong, and West. They wanted to palpate the breast to see whether there will be lumps in 3,000 women. They found lumps, clinical, clinically palpable lumps, in 194 out of the 3,000. And 23 out of the 194 were cancerous. Now, if you do the ratio uh, proportion, if 3,000 of the population you were able to get um, 23 cancer cases, we have a population of 30 million. So you split and give 15 to the men, 15 to the women. If you take 50 million as women, it means that you are looking at about 115,000. If every 3,000 will give you 23, if you take 50 million ratio proportion, you are looking at over 100,000 women who will be 
cancer cases. I'm not aware of the lumps. The lumps will go to close to uh, one point, about 900,000 women. Now, so this is to give you a mental picture of the cases, potential cases that are out there. Uh -huh. That, unfortunately, we are waiting for doc to receive them <laughs> at the clinic. Yes. And policy is the best thing to see how we can get them. When it comes to care, um, should I use the word luckily? We have, it's captured by the conditions that are covered by the health insurance. But those who practice will let you know that there are certain activities within the care uh, range that sometimes patients must take care of. And those issues can be an obstacle to patients receiving care. And how do we make sure that all these things are comprehensively handled by health insurance and not covered in bits or pieces? The road is advocacy, like we have in here. The more noise, the more cases made, the more the policymakers sit down again to review what is um, on the table. I know that recently, one of the drugs that can be used, the second generation acceptin, was absorbed by health insurance as a drug that will be covered by the insurance. Until that time, some few years ago, patients had to pay themselves. It took pressure. It took advocacy to get that on board. And because, like I said, we are stakeholders, we are there to support you so that you mount more pressure. Um, what I would like to say, and then maybe break here or pause here for the discussion to continue, is the issue of preventive care. You see, because 18 plus percent of all cancer cases are breast, CA, breast cancer cases, and because we potentially have close to 100,000 cases that will show up in the near future. And because the data also tells us that 70% of all cases come in stage 3 to stage 4. 70%. So for every 100 cases of breast cancer, 70% you can't do much about because it's crossed the help level. You only see how you psychologically manage. Because these are serious issues, we have to find ways as a country to make breast examination part of some of our um, annual activities so that we should get to the place where before a lady or a woman can register again biometrically to be, to, to be on the payroll, one of the requirements is the last breast cancer examination. Until we attach breast cancer results or examination results to procedures that are normal, some people will not still yield. And I always use seat belts as an example. If you don't wear your seat belt, the police will arrest you. Not because you are so, forgive me, they know you and they really don't want you to die, but because the statistics have shown that should you get an accident, you are likely to die. So it has been legislated. We don't care whether it's your rights or whatever. That is the law. So if the data is telling us that 100,000 of our women is a matter of time, they will be going away, it's up to us to have policy which will make sure that you are caught in the net even if you are willing or not. Because the studies have shown us that um, if we don't do that, we might lose you. So these are some of the things that going forward, I believe that we can do. The same with other chronic diseases like high blood pressure. 60, 70% of all deaths in adults is due to um, such cases. So um, the advocacy is good. The men are here, like uh, the poet said to all his boys. All the boys are here. <laughs> So we are willing to listen. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Honorable. When you talked about preventive care, I was going to ask if there were any policies, but it sounds like there are not. So we yes. have to be pushing Absolutely. for laws, yes. legislating that, yes. for instance, breast cancer examination too. So if, before I even get a job and I'm asked to go for medical exam, shouldn't it be just your sickling and Absolutely. breast cancer for women and possibly men? Today we are not talking about breast cancer in men. Maybe at some point the doctors would just... Because yes. we are told that men... Although the prevalence is very prevalence is very low, or the risk is very low, um, men are also at risk, and this is something we could look at. So, thank you, Doc. I'd ask, I would like for us to talk about some practical issues when it comes to breast cancer. So, Mrs. Malik, mm -hmm. talk to us. You wanted to tell us about treatment. Mm -hmm. That's a precursor to the doctors telling us what to expect when mm -hmm. one sees an abnormality. You are going to talk to us about treatment, so you can take it from there, and then I'll ask the doctors to come in. Well. 
continuing from where I paused. Right. So you, you press pause. See, I know. Now press play. Now play. <laughs> <laughs> so, in playing. Playing. I submitted my scans and reports to the doctor. Not to Dr. Abuado, because he was at Kolibu. So, I was referred to Kolibu to start the process. But proud to that, they tried to play on my mind to know whether I'm ready to get a breast off, whether one or two. I said, if it's three, I will still get those things off. Because I must You heard her? Yeah. So if you are taking the two, cry, no problem. So we went to Kolibu together with Mr. Malik. We started the process. And then I was booked for my surgery. I was so excited at the time. Not <laughs> And I like asking questions to know what really is happening to me. So he never slept. And I couldn't get Dr. Dede so much because she's always inside there butchering. So. <laughs> butchering? Yes. I, 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 I always tell them, I tell them on, on Thursdays, if you are butcher's day, they, they cut, cut, and it's so, it's so pathetic. About what? I'm joking about it, but it's not pleasant. Yeah, yeah. Every Thursday, I, I, I think that on the day I had mine. Your surgery was on a Thursday? It's always on a Thursday, mm. so you don't call these wild doctors on Thursday. Okay. They will be in the surgery, the theater from till... And it's, it's not present. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we're booked on my day. We were about nine. Mrs. Malik, between the time you went for your first, I mean, your first encounter mm -hmm. and the surgery, how long was this? I, my first encounter was in May. Of my which labs, year? 2019. Right. My labs and scans were concluded in early June. And then I was booked for my surgery in July. So I was, because the queue is that long. So I got my appointment, I had my surgery. And so it means my treatment plan was mastectomy, chemotherapy, and then radiotherapy. There are few um, people that had chemotherapy before mastectomy. I had mine first before I started chemotherapy. Okay, yeah. thank you. So I'll come to care because at this time you had done surgery, right? We yes. have talked up to surgery. Yes. For, uh, press pause. So, we'll come to care. <laughs> so ask Mrs. Mali, she's joined the clinician. She's saying Max said told me radio you something, know. <laughs> chemo something. So now we are going to ask them to explain. She said it without explaining. So any of you can take it first. Um, what, walk us through. I mean, when a patient comes to you, like Mrs. Malik did, and you have a suspicion, what do you do? And what should people look out for? Um, like she said, chemotherapy, at home. What, so tell us some practical issues we can take up when somebody presents a case. So who will go first? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So when somebody comes with an abnormality in the breast, like she said, we would usually first um, talk to you, and then we examine you. And then we ask for some images. So commonly we'll do an x-ray of the breast, which is a mammogram, normally for those who are more than 40 years or at least 35 years, plus or minus an ultrasound. Mm -hmm. And then once there's any suspicion, we go on to do a biopsy. And a biopsy just involves putting a, a needle usually into mm -hmm. the area of the abnormality, taking mm -hmm. a bit of it and sending it to the pathologist so they can look at it under the microscope to confirm for us whether it's cancer or not. Once we get that confirmation, it also comes with um, certain information on the characteristics of the cancer because that guides us as to the treatment. There are various modalities. Broadly, there's surgery, there's chemotherapy, which is just the use of cancer drugs or anti-cancer drugs. There's radiotherapy, which is the use of radiation to treat. Um, there's hormonal therapy. Dr. Abuado mentioned the hormonal factors. So if we give medications against those um, hormones, then it starves the hormones and that would help to kill off the cancer cells. Then there's the targeted treatment. Um, Dr. Kumboy mentioned Herceptin. So that is a specific drug that is used for certain types of cancer. So we use different combinations of these modalities and in different sequences. So um, 
Mrs. Malik mentioned that she had surgery first. Others had chemotherapy first. So those are the, usually the two um, that would go first, either surgery or chemotherapy. And again, we assess the, the, the stage or how far the cancer has gone to decide whether we should start with chemo or we should start with surgery. And then, of course, we look at a few other things. So surgery and surgery is basically there are two types of surgery that can be done. So one is to take off the whole breast, which is the mastectomy that I mentioned. And the other one is just to take off the lump. So that's also possible. We don't always have to take the whole breast off. If the lump is very small and it's limited to a particular area, we can just take the lump off and continue with the other forms of treatment. So that is very much a possibility. Um, and usually with the surgery, we also go into the armpits. I think we've mentioned that the cancer can go into the armpit. So we always go into the armpit to take out some of the lymph nodes there as well. So that's basically surgery. What I would like to add to surgery is that there can also be reconstruction. So one of the reasons why people don't come is that they don't want to lose their breasts. But even if you have to, there's the chance of having a new breast built by the plastic surgeons. And that is something that is done. We work closely with them. And for those, some, some people don't mind, they are all right. Those who would want to have that, that option is available. So that's all surgery. Um, chemotherapy is the use of anti-cancer drugs. There are different types of chemotherapy, um, chemotherapeutic agents. So again, we look at the type of cancer and we decide which drugs to use. Normally we give it in a combination. So a number of drugs which kind of attack the cancer cells from different angles. So working together, it becomes very effective. And we give it in what we call cycles, usually every three weeks to allow the body to recover in between the cycles. Well, let me leave you to do that. <laughs> okay, yeah, so Doc, so, um, before you come in, you know we also hear about people's hair falling off. Um, you didn't lose your hair, did you? I did. You did. Okay. <laughs> All right. So as you talk, you can also tell us about at what point you okay. do must everybody lose their hair, for instance. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so thank you very much. As my boss has said. <laughs> so the cancer, so the chemotherapy, what it does is that it acts on actively dividing cells, cells that are dividing very fast. And so, as I said, the cancer cells, they, they are very recalcitrant. They don't obey anything, so they are always divided. So in the process of attacking the cancer cells, there are other cells too that are actively divided. You see that our hair grows. That's why when you shave, some of us don't have hair. But those who are, when you, it grows, it's always growing because the cells are actively divided. So it tends to attack them. They are normal cells, but they are also attacked by them because it doesn't discriminate between cancer and normal. So, that is how come hair loss is one of the main things that comes with. But a lot of people, after they receive the chemotherapy, they, their hair grows back. Okay. Then another thing I have to ask, ask my boss was. So it's not permanent? No, oh, but most before it grows back. Can see my hair ah, now. So, no, you are mystery Sorry. already, so I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> it grows back. All right. It grows back. <laughs> and uh, another thing that uh, my boss said is that the treatment of cancer. Not only breast cancer now, it's what you call multidisciplinary. It's not, the decision is not taken by only one person. So it's a group that comes to the, together to take the decision on how to manage it. So, and now the treatment is individual based. So every person and how the person's treatment is. So it's not that everybody is going to follow. That's how some, that's how some people have surgery first before chemo, others have chemo. And that is one thing that I want us to push. You realize that a lot of people that have managed for breast cancer that have not been well managed into quotation commas, and they have been to places that they were supposed to manage it's because this multidisciplinary thing did not happen. When you come to Kolebu, before somebody get a treatment, the surgeon is involved, the radiation oncology is involved, clinical psychologist is involved, breast care nurse is involved, plastic surgeon is involved, pathologist is involved. So there is a tumor board meeting. <laughs> She's become an expert. <laughs> <laughs> so the anesthetist can mean when the surgeon, the anesthetist actually work with surgeon of a sort. But when it comes to the decision taking, they do, are not involved. But it's when we are coming to operate, then they are involved. Mm -hmm. So this team meets and the decision is taken. So before somebody is treated, this team will have agreed on the modality of treatment. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people 
get this treatment, this thing has not been followed. So a lot of problems happen. For example, you, you have surgery. It should have been planned that when you have a surgery, there is a golden period for which if you need chemo, the chemo should start. For which if you need radiation therapy, it should start. So if these things have not been planned ahead of time, you can have the surgery, then you don't get the others, then recurrence or something happens. So the multidisciplinary thing is so important. And that is why for me, for cancers in general, I think coming to places like teaching hospitals where this team, you can get it, I think I advocate for that so that you get the best of care as much as possible. Right. Then one of the treatments, we are surgeons, but when you reach stage four, stage four, that means if the disease spread, most of the time we don't operate. The reason is that the operation is to deal with the cancer, to take it away so that it doesn't spread. So if the cancer has spread, then going to take it away, what will it add? And research has even shown that people that have a spread and they had a surgery, and those that did not have surgery, the, the difference statistically it was not significant. Mm. So most of the time when people come to us in stage four, we are not able to do surgery. But they have other forms of treatment. It doesn't mean that when you have stage four, we are going to allow you. We are going to have other treatment. Stage like four means you buy one with It means that it has, everybody can die. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you don't have a cancer. But when you have stage four, it means it has spread. But we are not God. So we cannot. Exactly. People have got stage four. And they have lived beyond five years, six years. Okay. Once they went through treatment. Okay. So it's not uh, as a death. It will come, but it doesn't mean that when you are stage four, you will die. I, I think what stage four means is that it's not curable. It's not curable. It's not curable. So you are not able to get rid of it completely, but you are still able to manage it, yes. All right. So stage four is management. That's what is being said. But it doesn't mean you are going to die. Thank you. So, Mrs. Malik, we are going to talk about care. We want you to talk about the kind of care you receive, because that has been some of the problems or reasons people don't even seek health care because of the kind of experiences they get when they get to the facilities. So you won't say because your two doctors are here, you are not going to say what you are. So say the good and the bad. We want to know how we are doing as a nation. So first, tell us about medical care or medical treatment. You can talk about the health facilities. And the doctors will chip in to as well to see if we have enough facilities and how we are doing as a country. But you tell us about your experience, medical care. Then add social care, family support. Already Mr. Malik has been supportive. We are giving him two. Yes. So <laughs> tell us about care. Well, um, I personally, I think I had the best care because I only didn't get up to go to the hospital. But as I made that decision, I started praying that God should guide the doctors that I would deal with. They should tolerate me. And I should also be in the state to be able to ask questions that will make my treatment better. So I think I kind of got the kind of doctors I prayed for is to champions. Yes. <laughs> and um, it was okay for me because... No, I don't like okay. Specific. It was very good for me. Right. I, since my encounter with them and Kolebu, I always tell people who call me on breast cancer that the best place to go is Kolebu. Okay. And that's what Doc said. The team is there. So it's not like one person is deciding uh -huh. and then the next time they don't even know where you have to go to and all. Medically, I think, I think sometimes to we, the patients, we don't want to ask questions. The people are more than the doctors. So if you go and the doctor is tired, which is obvious, and they will meet something. I overheard someone on the radio saying, you go to Kualibu, you meet Dr. A, and then the next visit, you meet another doctor, and then the next visit, you meet another doctor. Then it becomes a problem because this one will only look at your folder and try to continue with his or her own mm -hmm. knowledge. I didn't get that. Right. I had a constant flow. Mm. So it, it worked for me. Right. Uh -huh. And yes, when it comes to the labs, there were a few um, places that were recommended mm. that I go to do the test and all that. Mm. And they were kind of accurate for me mm -hmm. because it, it really 
fell in place as right. the doctors predicted. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. Talk about social care. How was family support? Did you have stigma issues? Um, what was family support like? Church, friends? When it comes to stigma, I think we, the victims, we are the stigma ourselves. Because Uban, I've told you, I don't have breasts. So what will you stigmatize me with? You won't tell me because I don't have breasts. I shouldn't cash my money from the bank. I won't allow you. So when we psych our mind that we refuse that, I don't think that stigma thing will even have a role to play. But already, psychologically, we have made up our minds that because I have breast cancer, I need to hide. So we champion the stigmatization, and people embrace it, and they hate it in our face. So I didn't get that. Right. Yes, I didn't get that. My family was very supportive, my siblings. How did you take the news? You said you were worried about how your family oh, people was... were crying. They cried. People were crying. Your children, what did they do? My kids, they were strong. Okay. Because um, for them, we took some time. Because my first daughter at the time was in GH3, that preparing for exams. So we were very careful mm -hmm. because of the loss of hair I will go through right. and all that. I need to psych them that mommy will start looking like some zombie. You have to accept her like that. Right. Mommy will become very sick. Mm -hmm. You must be there for her. Mm -hmm. So for the kids, they were okay. Right. Just I like, took us some, some time, time to prepare them for that. And yes, they started seeing the changes. And for my church, uh, some thought I have traveled because of my job. Right. And I remember a reverend minister calling. Like sh he heard I'm sick. Oh, I shouldn't tell anybody. I said, Papa, no. Tell them I'm very sick. <laughs> so that their prayers will not be diverted to things from abroad. <laughs> it will be channeled to my sickness. Right. And I was really serious yeah. about that. Right. So as soon as I said that, they started coming to my house to visit to pray, to give every support right. that I needed. So I personally, I encountered so much support, right. medically and socially, yeah. Thank you, and we thank God for a good social support system yeah. and a good medical support system. Yeah. Kudos to our medical team. Oh, here. yeah. But I want to ask to our doctors, all three of you, and more importantly to Honorable, how are we doing as a nation in terms of facilities? Do you have enough? adequate facilities mm. in the hospital to take care of the cases, um, labs, medication. How are we doing as a nation? Any of you can take it. Yeah, let, let me say that um, as former board chairman for the Kolebu Teaching Hospital, it's not only with breast cases that Kolebu is the best place to go. In fact, uh, the last time I had a classmate in GSS, the mother was in a private hospital with pulmonary embolism. She was almost gone. She called me. I said, you have to go to Kolebu. And by the grace of God, she's alive. You know, so the, the point is that if you go to the right place for help, you will get the kind of help that is necessary to keep you alive. Mm -hmm. And Kolebu, we should all remember, is a referral facility. So the point is that you first go to a primary or secondary. And if you need intervention that is tertiary or quaternary, then you are sent to Kolebu. And I can bet you that the best brains and skills, not only in West Africa, I can say in the whole of Africa, is in the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. So always take advantage of that. Now, I know that the seventh parliament of which I was a member, um, we've approved facilities to improve the infrastructure in the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. There's going to be um, a new maternity block. There's a new urology block coming up. We are also looking at building a new surgical block. And uh, yes, the old one, that one is being worked on. As for the maternity and urology, it's been approved and the funding is secured. But it's the surgical that we are still doing the talking. So that we can have a new, the, the old, the, the current surgical block is a, uh, what's the word? It's gone on pension. <laughs> Uh, as it's we a speak, nice or... <laughs> yes, as we speak, it's yeah. gone on patient. It's a, uh, it's been, uh, it needs some uh, help. Now, the, the plan is to build a new one and renovate this one right. for other uh, services. Right. And let me also say that you, it is difficult to have enough space for curative medicine. Mm -hmm. 
or curative care. So instead of going down to the bottom to receive the cases, we must have strategies to stop the cases from getting to the hospital. And that's why I talked about Preventive. Yes, issues like how do you make sure that you catch the cases. And let me um, maybe end here with this particular food for thought. All the cases that present at stage 3 and 4, most of them were not sitting at home. Once they were in stage 1 and 2, they were either visiting a bishop, visiting a spiritual home, Very visiting a, a malam. So, so hit it home, hit it hard. Exactly. So I think the strategy that was used to address maternal mortality some years ago must be used in catching these people. Right. What they did was that in, in addressing maternal mortality, they realized that some pregnant women, those who were dying, most of them went to untrained traditional birth attendants. So two things were done. They trained the traditional birth attendants and actually put in a policy where if you bring a pregnant woman, you are paid for bringing a pregnant woman to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Because research showed that they were keeping the pregnant woman because of the money that they receive right. and the, the things that you have to present when you're, you bring your pregnancy. So we also must find a way right. to become partners with all these prayer camps mm -hmm. and train them on the signs and symptoms of breast disease right. and possibly elevate it to an incentive mm -hmm. so that if, if a prayer warrior or a prayer camp brings a patient to Kolebu, they know that oh, even when you take it, you get a reward. Mm -hmm. And in that case, then the, your competitors who are causing damage become your partners. Right. These are some of the innovative things we have to think about, policy-wise. So on point, Doctor. Thank you. And Doctor, I asked about the day-to-day -day care at the facility. How do you see what do you say about that? I think we... We are doing quite well. We have facilities for surgery, for chemotherapy, for radiotherapy, for the targeted therapy. But Kolebu is only a small part of, or takes care of only a small part of the people in the country. Um, Kumasi as well has Konkwanoche, and they are also able to do all those things. Beyond that, when it comes to radiotherapy, for it's only available in Accra and Kumasi. So obviously there's room to improve on the facilities. Um, Chemotherapy is a little more widespread, um, surgery similarly so. But we need probably a bit more of comprehensive cancer units because it makes it a, um, a lot easier on the patient. Not that you have surgery somewhere and then you have to travel. I mean, when people are, let's say somebody's in the Malta region for radiotherapy, usually it has to be done every day for a number of weeks. Right. So this person doesn't have accommodation here, doesn't have family here difficult. Right. So definitely I think there's room to improve the facilities to make it easier for the patients. If it's more accessible they would patronize it better. Right. Thank you. Dr. Wado, please, will you tell us how we are doing in terms of vaccination, awareness, screening? How are we doing? I mean, every year October we do, we do this. But as a nation, beyond October, how are we doing in terms of awareness and screening and all of that? You know, I think the screening and the awareness, most of the time, is hammered only during uh, October. October. But after that, I think uh, it goes down a little. So I think uh, it should become something that we have to think. As uh, Honorable has said, if you make it that it's a necessity that, you know, in our part of the uh, world, if a woman comes to me and with maybe headache, and I go that I'm coming to examine the breast, if you are not careful, the mind behind that why I came with headache, why are you coming to examine my breast? But if it becomes something that is very comprehensive and everybody understands, then I think in the consulting room we'll be getting a lot of, we'll be picking a lot of cases as early as possible. But people have to understand so that people will not misinterpret it, that the, the people just want to touch people's breast, that's why. They, I think <laughs> when you push for that, we'll be able to. Right. <laughs> Dr. Brest. <laughs> Thank you. So we are wrapping up our conversation. Mm -hmm. Honorable gave us his food for thought already. So I will give one minute to each of you to give us uh, to wrap up. Give us your final words. I think we'll have, we have a few minutes of questions and answers. So some questions will come up. But by way of wrapping this up, um, your final words. Okay. Starting with your boss. <laughs> 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 Okay, so just to harp on the early detection again, um, 
if we pick up breast cancer early and it's treated adequately, the outcomes are very good. So let's not stay away from hospital um, and wait for the cancer to become advanced. Then it complicates the whole picture. But let's seek help early. And once we go through that, the chances that we'll be very, very high. Thank you. Yes, um, I want to say my boss has said the most important thing. But what I also have to say is that breast cancer is not contagious. If somebody gets breast, breast cancer, going close to the person or the person being with your wife, you being with the person, does not mean that you also get a cancer. So the men that suck their wives and everything, after they've gotten cancer or after they've had surgery, please, I want to appeal with them they should accept their wife. They stood be, uh, before God and said for better, for worse. So when the worst comes, you should be ready to embrace it. Thank you, doctor. Mrs. Malik. Yeah. Well, I would say let's take care of our breasts like we do with our hair, our fingernails, and our, our dresses. The way you know you do your touch-up every two weeks, try and make time for your breasts every month, not only in October. Because you may not get to the next October and breast cancer can take you Thank you so much. Please let's give our panel a round of applause. So we are going to allow for three questions, maximum four if I'm in a good mood. So, and please, no three in one questions. One question goes straight to the point. Don't tell a tale hamper, before the hamper question. question. <laughs> hamper question, no. This one is single malt whiskey, one. So please, yes. So I see one, I see two. All right, so please, I see three. The fourth is when I'm in a good mood, so nobody should raise their hands. What do we do, please? Um, the first person, yeah. Hello, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, I would like to know if... Tell the... us your name, please. Okay, my name is Yabibi Olenda. Maud, <laughs> hi. So I would like to know if um, after the surgery, the breast is still sensitive. I would like to know that. Sensitivity? Yes. Good. So that is, um, I, I, I think we are talking about the reconstruction. I think we are talking about the reconstruction. Like how? Because if you do mastectomy, off. breast is no more there. But don't it's you there, know? There is skin, but there is no breast. breast. Okay. The, um, I think you are talking about the reconstruction means you remove the breast. Yes. You have skin, skin covering. Covering your chest. Like a man's chest. Does it become like a man's yeah, chest? No, man, flat. no, not like the become man's flat. chest because the man has a nipple. The man's chest without nipple. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. So it's without, like flat like that. Like, yeah. like yeah. So like your back. It becomes like your like, back. Yeah. Like like the normal skin. Okay. No, the the skin is there, so the nerves in the skin are there. So the skin will be sensitive. Yeah. But you won't get that sensation from nipple. The nipple sensation no, because let me go no practical nipple. with you. <laughs> You see the breast that I got off. If it's time for the, <laughs> like, uh, you know, there's some vibration there. It, it becomes like, <laughs> and I feel the same thing here. But say, Mr. Malik, Jiga, he wants to be on the road. That kind of thing doesn't affect wherever I got the thing. It only, so, a honor, dog could not tell you because I'm trying to move. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. Is your question answered? There is no feeling. Feelings gone. Feeling uh -huh. Okay. What about this vibration? <laughs> there is vibration. That could also be feelings, right? Okay. <laughs> there was a gentleman. Yes. Yes. Um, my name is Paul. And my question goes to Dr. Okubo, from, uh, from Daily Statesman. And my question has to do with uh, legislation. How do we give a legislative instrument to breast cancer? Who are those to push for it? Uh, the question was to you. Yes, sir. So let me say that allies are offshoot from bills or a law. So you must first have an act 
then to make the act effective or to give clearer meaning, you have allies which try to tell the very detailed things that the law should achieve. Now, I don't think that um, you virtually need an ally to get effective breast care. What you can get is you have to first talk about the law. You know? So as we speak, breast cancer, like we said, is captured in care, the NHI list of diseases. Breast cancer is part of the curative and all our health care here. But if there are specific things we want to achieve with breast care and we feel that a law can help us, then we can look at a law, which will be the big one. I nearly said umbrella, but because we are done quite street, I'm not saying umbrella, but you look at a law, which is the big one. Okay, so let's say we can have a law that says that you have to present your last breast examination before you get your uh, SNIT uh, updated. That is a law. And then out of that law, you can have an ally which says that to make that thing uh, through, uh, your employer should give you uh, an allowance for your breast examination. So I hope I am clear. So um, based on what we think in terms of policy, it can end up in the uh, enactment of a law. That's what I say. But for now, I think we are doing, it's not bad for breast care. We can do more on the preventive side. And that's why I shared some of the Food for thought. Right. Thank you. Our last question, our third question. Yes. There's a question here. Thank you. I'm Genevieve Thompson. My question is this breast cancer month, is it enough? Just October. Um, does it go to the rural areas? Is, or is it just in the capitals that you can see the pink pink all around? Do we have statistics after? Is that show how many people went for the um, examination. How friendly are the staff of the hospital when you get there and you want to do the advertise they come for free. When you go there and you look at the nurse's face, someone will tell you turn around and go. It's like you come to bother here. So how true are we being about this whole breast cancer man? And they said we shouldn't do hamper. But the last one is <laughs> abroad. I know that when there's a genetic this thing, your daughter, once she has a certain free this thing that she can approach at a certain stage of her life, yeah. as soon as she has her menstruation, she should come and check yeah. at a certain time. So they keep track of her because they know that the possibility is in the family. Yeah. Are we doing that here? Because I've seen friends who have died. I look at their daughters. As soon as I see their daughters, I wonder what is going on in their head. Are they scared? Are they checking? So this is what I want to share. Thank you. Thank you. And to quickly add to that, um, the question she asked about yeah. the reach of what we are yes. doing. Is this just an Accra yeah. business? Yeah. Or is it happening in other places, the rural yeah. places? So, so, yeah. so the month of October is actually celebrated across the country, country uh, by the Ghana Air Service. So every, all the facilities across Ghana is a breast awareness month. You know, it's synonymous, breast cancer, breast awareness. So they dedicate activities around that time to make sure that we, we encourage screening, dedicate some, set some uh, posts, and they actually report, they report back on the activities across the country. Um, you know, what we are doing here is part of the solution. There must be constant advocacy. Although October is Breast Awareness Month, if you call me in June for a breast program, I'll come. Like I always do. Yes. <laughs> if you call me in July, I'll come. So, and that's why, that's how come they build systems and structures elsewhere. There are people who are advocates. They tell themselves that I'm going to do breast issues forever or till till. And everywhere they meet you is breast. How do we make sure that breast, like, you know, some say once a month. Someone can say every Tuesday should be breast Tuesday. You know, people, just innovation ideas. Yeah. And you'll be shocked with time, breast will be discussed as places yeah. that breast was never mentioned. So uh, there, was question, there was also the question that is there any provision for No, as we speak, as we speak, speak, so that's I mean, part of the if, if, if a lady walks to the clinic and she wants a breast examination because of family history, she will not be turned away. Mm. You know, so yes, but we don't have a policy that sends you a message that show up. We don't have it now. Thank you. And to add, yes, um, Doctor, before you, how friendly 
are the people are, apart from the two of you. Apart from the doctors, <laughs> I, I don't no. think we are the people to I answer know. that. <laughs> I'm sure your patients, the doctors, you are very passionate. And, yes. But then the people, the, the nurses, first, the point of uh, first no. point of call from before, OPD before through. you get to the nurse. <laughs> What is the gen? Because some are stopped because of attitude. So you get, you know some, you see some dog. Well, I mean, I think that's that's a cut across in every every right. place. Right. Even maybe in your place, maybe I'll come. The receptionist will not be nice. The next person I see will be nice. nice. Yeah. So I I always tell it. Um, I think was it today. I was talking to a patient yesterday who had to go back to Kolebu, and he says, "What if I go and they're upset with me?" And I said, first of all, I don't think they'll be upset. But even if they are." You are there for your health. So put the fact that the doctor is upset. Don't let that bother you. I think when Mrs. Malik talked about the way she approached cancer, I liked it very much. You see she had a positive attitude. She wasn't ready for anybody to come and give her stress. And I think that is the attitude we must all have. Right. So we cannot say, and we try. We try to be nice. We try and um, treat our patients nicely. But there are times when we may fall short. But I think when we are on the receiving end, we shouldn't also let that the real uh, uh, treatment path. Okay. Yes, we should close our eyes to that and then move on. Right. I was going to add to the question about the maybe family of somebody who's had um, breast cancer. Usually what we do is, like you said, we don't have a system that will prompt you, but normally what we would do is we would talk to the family members. So we would ask you if you have children, sisters, mother, and then we ask you to send the information. If, of course, the person has also passed on, we talk to the relatives. Uh, let them be aware that it could be that this is genetic and they may have a chance of, um, or they have an increased risk. So we speak to them to um, also look out for themselves. The problem is in Ghana, a lot of people don't share their illnesses. Right. Exactly. So in your family, there may be breast cancer and you don't even know. Maybe you only get to know when the person passes on. Right. But people have had it and survived and nobody knows. So that's also something I think we need to talk about. We shouldn't be afraid to talk about our illnesses. Um, if there's been an illness, there's been breast cancer, you should share so that other people know their risk and then they can also look out. Right. Thank you. Doctor, you wanted to quickly add something? Um, I, was, I wanted to say that the genetic studies, sometimes we do, when we see that you have a very strong um, but the cost, the cost, because to do the BRCA1 and BRCA2, it's not even done in the country, but in some parts, in or South Africa. And hmm. So cost, next time we have a symposium, I think that cost is going to be a very important part of it, yeah. So there is one last question. I think my mood is still very good, so. Hey. All right, thank you very much. My, my name is Michael, I write for the Ghanaian Times. Um, just a quick one. Uh, Doc, you were saying that, okay. My name is Michael, I write from the, for the Ghanaian Times. So the issue about um, breast cancer is not contagious. Does it mean that uh, men can still go ahead and do the regular touching and no. sucking if there's cancer in the breast? No. <laughs> it's very important, too, please. Very important. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, the, the, the truth of the matter is that, I mean, you can do whatever you want, but psychologically, you yourself, you wouldn't like to, maybe the person has a nipple discharge, blood is coming. You will not be comfortable going to suck a breast with blood coming. So those why you may not. But the other breast that is not affected. You pray on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, is your question answered? Yes. So I have one question from our online viewers. Um, Dr. George Donfer, who is watching online, is asking. I think um, Dr. Dede addressed it. He may have missed it. Any hope of survival for stage 4 cancer patients? How long on average can they live under medical treatment? All right, so we mentioned that with stage four, it means it's not curable, but then it can be managed. So it's not curable, but we would still give treatment. So we would still give chemotherapy, we would still radiate, depending on what the situation is. So there's some form of treatment that can be given. In terms of survival, the last studies that were done, but that was about looking at figures up to all. Um, looking at patients after about 2010. Four years survive, five years survival for stage four was about 15%. But I think since then, over the past 10 years, things have improved. And as things continue to improve, the survival rates also improve. So I'm sure, pretty sure that if we did studies now, probably those figures would be a bit higher. 
than that. Thank you. We have a final question. Um, uh, Belinda Koffer says that um, with the number of relatively high number of people using breast enhancement products, mm. that the use of these products put you at risk of getting breast cancer. As far as I'm aware, no. First of all, I don't even know what the breast enhancement products are. <laughs> so it's, if it's something that is involved, that involves the use of chemicals, then maybe there could be some risk. But to be honest, I don't know what the enhancers are. I don't know how they work. Um, generally, in the literature, I haven't come across any, any link with enhanced, breast enhancing products. But specifically, I don't know what they are, so it's difficult to say. Belinda, we don't know what they are. <laughs> so if you could just be specific, but maybe you can just, um, if you are watching on Facebook, you can just write it on Facebook and then we all learn. Because um, all of us don't know what the enhancement products are. <laughs> so we want to thank you. Thank you. It's been an interesting discussion. Don't you agree? Please let's give them a round of applause again. And then just some highlights. Um, Doctor, when doctor was telling us about the myths and misconceptions and the symptoms, he mentioned that because the thing is painless, usually we are not moved. And this was corroborated by Mrs. Malik, that when she felt pain and discomfort, then she moved. So we have to pay attention to the painless and the non-discomfortable nature of the, the, um, the new growth or whatever, the abnormality we see in our breast when it happens. Um, we have also touched on preventive preventive care, having laws and policies that help us to prevent this because we don't have enough to cure it. There is also the mention of multidisciplinary approach to addressing or managing breast cancer. And we have taken a cue from this. At our next symposium, we are going to have a whole multidisciplinary um, panel so that we address this holistically. There is also the issue of the healer shopping. People from the shop, healthcare shopping, so they are from the pasta to the fetish piece to the before they get to the doctors. And this is something we should tell our friends and relatives. It's better to go straight and then also advocate for incentives, partner these competitors, because they are competitors. And mm. we hear them on radio all the time, advertising for having a cure to all kinds of cancers. So let's work at partnering with them and incentivizing them to push their patients to the right sources. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable, thank you, Dr. Dede. Thank you, Dr. Aguado. And thank you, Mystery Woman. Thank you so much for sharing your survival story with us. It's been a wonderful time, and I want to thank you and hand over to the executive director from here. Please clap for me. <laughs> thank you very much. This has really been enlightening. Interestingly, I think we do take breast cancer for granted. In a way, I felt like I had taken it for granted. I actually didn't know the depth of what I was going into when I said we should have a breast cancer symposium. And distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I want you to join me to give an amazing round of applause to our distinguished and eminent speakers today. Our moderator has also done very well. She's been very piercing. Thank you very much, Dr. Denchi. I think more deeply as I listen to you about the obstacles to patients receiving care, the obstacles. So cost is one, but I also see a lot of invisible obstacles. I see stigma to be a problem. I see even religion to have become a problem in our fight against breast cancer. 70% of all cancer cases come in stage three to four. That is alarming. Something that we can find solutions to, something that we can give help to people, if only they would come early. I think one thing that we have also failed to do is to make proper announcement of the places where you can get screened. And I was waiting for my speakers to say it. So sometimes people don't want to go to the big hospitals. But I think that next year, the media, when you are advertising, tell people the places that they can go and get screened. I think we haven't brought screening to the doorsteps of the individual, and therefore, we haven't really made it as available, and we haven't created the level of awareness that we seek to do. And as an institute, I assure you that we are committed to helping this to go even further. 
I think that our speakers today have offered a lot of hope. There's still a lot that we can do even after breast cancer. Even at stage four, they are saying that there are still ways of at least relieving your pain and giving you something that would help you to live a little bit longer. That, I think, is very, very significant. But I think most amazingly today, I have learned that advocacy is still very possible. We need to even reach further. Despite the fact that cost is an issue, I want to assure you that next year, when DI takes the platform again to do something about breast cancer, we won't stay in Accra. God willing, we would have resources and we ensure to do even more dissemination of this very, very valuable information. We are committed, and we know that, God willing, we will be able to do it. We want to tell all our listeners out there on Facebook, don't wait. Today is already yesterday's tomorrow. You should make haste whilst the sun shines. Let's all make a commitment, not just for ourselves, because it is for everyone. Losing a loved one is painful. It rips the family apart. It tears our very fabric of society. And it is a deterrent to the development that we hope to achieve. And therefore, as a society, we must fight breast cancer. We must fight it with all our resources, our strength, and our energy. Thank you very much. And on this note, I want to say very, very big thank you to our speakers. But before that, I also want to say thank you to our sponsors for today's symposium. Ghana Free Zones Authority. Ambassador Michael Kwe is not here, but thank you very much. He willingly gave us so much financial support. To the Tree Crops Development Authority, I say thank you. To the CEOs who are here today, I say thank you to Doris, Dr. Norris Hammer. I know he's somewhere out there, the CEO for MDF. Thank you to my husband, Mr. Tibu Dauk. He's always my first financial person that I go to. I want to say thank you to Ms. Kathleen Adi. She's the deputy director for NCCA. She graced this function. And th thank you very much. The notice was very short, but she has come to be with us and to support us. I want to say a special thank you to Yaira Poshiaklu. She's like a younger sister to me. She brought us the people from Uriel Foundation. I'm sure you've seen them here. They are volunteers, and they partnered us to deliver this program. We've been joined on Facebook by my eminent board chair, the Right Honorable Professor Michael Kwe, by board members and past directors of the Great Dankwa Institute. And I say thank you to all of them for their support. Thank you to Integrated Joe Science and Blackwood. I will still come for my check, so I'm announcing it to you. And to all others who have made it here, Nura, thank you. Those were beautiful and well-written poems. Thank you very much, the Tesco Knights, the MPP ladies, and everyone who has made it here today. To our speakers, I don't even know what to say. We have something for you. Madin, straight time, my people. So today we want to surprise Mrs. Suzanne Malik of Modloko Foundation. There's a lot about the foundation. For me, we are not looking at a great foundation because we believe that the small ones do greater things. We like her spirit. We like her tenacity. We like her forcefulness. I saw her speak at a function that had nothing to do with breast cancer. And I said to myself that this is an amazing woman with an amazing personality. Let's give her a round of applause. Mrs. Malik is organizing a walk, a health walk on breast cancer on the 30th of this month. And we want to support you from the Institute. We want to support you. We want to support this amazing initiative that you're doing. We want to give to you 20 cartons of water. We also have We've also customized face towels. Yeah, We've got a hundred face yeah. towels with Dankwa Institute and with the breast cancer logo to show our support for your foundation. 
And then we have here a paltry sum, but it's something we know will go to helping organizing 5,000 Ghana CDs. I want to give that to you and to tell you, well done, are you cool, and more grief to your elbows. You're welcome. this thing upon myself not because I want to gain personally but to impact lives and I'm glad that out of nothing Dankwa Institute was able to recognize my impact and they have chosen to support us I didn't talk about it and I didn't know they would talk about it but with the heavyweight I'm holding with the heavyweight I'm holding if you are close to Lejekuku, which is Teshi, just walk through. We'll do screening as well, free. That is the little we can do. And to Dan Kwan Street, anytime you want us, we will be there. Thank you. We will be there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Susan, thank you and well done. And we want to give something to our <laughs> panelists. Okay. Um, we did... Well, you said no hamper questions, but these are hamper games. <laughs> so they are beauty products. Mm. For our men panelists, our male panelists, please give it to your beautiful wives. We know you have beautiful wives. We checked. <laughs> Actually went on the internet and checked to make sure that it will go there. Yeah. So we have here mm. some hampers we'll present to you. So this is first for Honorable Dr. Okoboy. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And this is for our awesome doctor, Agradeo. Nice. And then, of course, the amazing Doctor Florence Tede. Without any discrimination, we still give this <laughs> to <laughs> Susan. The amazing, amazing and awesome Susan Mali, the Oliver. <laughs> Thank you. So once again, I say thank you to you all for being here, for gracing us with your presence. DI is going to continue the advocacy chat room. Every other month, we'll have a topic that we will choose. Whether it's a health issue, a development issue, but it should be something that concerns everyone. And as I said, irrespective of political affiliation, religious affiliation, ethnic background, gender or race, breast cancer attacks anyone. It doesn't care who you are. And therefore, we know there are so many other issues. We commit once again. We hope you, you come when we call on you. We hope you support us. We say thank you to our sponsors once again. We say thank you to our eminent panelists, to our amazing moderator. I think I hounded her so many times. And Estina is my colleague at University of Ghana, and she's a familiar face here at Dampa Institute. Thank you all for being here. We have some refreshments. You are most welcome to join us, and we hope we can call on you again. I would now like to invite Razak to do a closing prayer for us. Good evening. Please, let's pray. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Amen. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Amin. Malik Yawmiddin. Amin. Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'in. Amin. Ihdina Sirot Al-Mustakim. Amin. Sirot Al-Lazina Namta Alayhim. Amin. Ghailin Maktubi Alayhim wa Liddolim. Amin. Thank you all once again. The refreshments are out. 
There are also gift bags for everyone who came. We have Max from um, Susan Maud Local Foundation. We still have customized face towels, the Dankwa Institute and the cancer symbol on it. And we also have some key rings and they are all in gift bags for all of you. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Please, we'll take some photographs. So we'll take some photographs with the panelists first and then we can have some photographs with the audience. And the photographer is here. We can take some group pictures together, especially those of us in the amazing TRS. Thank you. <laughs>